to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it. We have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to a well-designed business. It's Power Talk Friday. Today, I am joined by Howard A. Lim of How Creative. We've talked about the importance of branding on the show several times before with my creative director, Nicole Heimer, the founder of Glory and Brand. Because of conversations with her, as well as uh, with other valued guests like Kay Whitaker and Ray Bozick, to name a few, we know the importance of having a brand voice and the importance of needing to express its uniqueness. Today, Howard is going to talk to us about not only how to build a brand, but what to think about and to do now, especially if your goal is to build a 10-figure world-class brand. Howard has 35 years experience of building multi-million, even billion dollar brands, mostly in the creative space, brands like Disney, Mattel, and AT&T. Yet Howard has also taken small and medium companies and positioned them with a focused architecture plan. And he's here to talk about his DNA method that puts branding into perspective and makes sense in an actionable way. There's a lot of valuable information in this episode. And if this is an episode you have been waiting for, I'd advise you to maybe grab a pen and paper or prepare to listen to it more than once. (laughs) Okay. Whether you want to be a world-class design brand or you're happy with profitability and one or two employees, Howard's advice is applicable. And when an expert like Howard talks to us who has worked with the likes of Apple and Disney, I think we should listen, right? Now, before we get to the show, I want to remind you that tickets for Luann Live are open now. We will be in Orlando, Florida, November 5th to 8th, and we are going to have our usual fantastic time, all the while building our knowledge and strategies for creating a well-designed business within a well-designed life. Ticket sales opened just two days ago, March 22nd, 2023. And guess what? The first 60 people who registered to be with me at Luann Live will be included in our Breakfast Buddy Mornings. Yes, the first 30 people will join me for a private breakfast on Monday morning. And the second 30 people will join me for a private breakfast on Tuesday. You will also get a signed preferred seating on the day that you are a breakfast buddy. How fun is that, right? I'm so excited. I cannot wait to meet you. Now, head over to LuannLive.com to grab your seat, your ticket before they are gone. All right, let me introduce you to Howard. Hey, Howard, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. You're welcome. Glad to be here. So, Howard, first of all, I think it's super cool that you're like this amazingly accomplished business person in the world. I mean, reading your bio is like, oh, okay, like sit up straight for this interview, Luann. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But that your wife is a listener of the show, and that's how you found our podcast. So uh, shout out and hello to your wife. What's her name? Her name's Stephanie. Okay. Well, and she works for a commercial interior design firm, you were saying? Yeah, she works for a commercial building where she's a project manager for residential and commercial. Oh, interesting, interesting. Okay, so, well, hello, Stephanie, and thank you for connecting us. Okay, so, Howard, um, what I love about what you do is I think it fits really nicely, and I'm so glad that Stephanie suggested that you um, come on the show because what you do is you you help people create a lasting brand in a nutshell. There's a lot more to it. um, But in the big picture, that's the takeaway that I'm getting from it. And 
we have iconic brands in our industry. We have Corey Damon Jenkins. We have Shea McGee. We have Nate Berkus. We have Mikkel Welch, um, Tiffany Brooks, right? We have a lot of really outstanding examples of an iconic brand that has generated their, they've built their company to the point where they've generated multiple revenue streams through product development, licensing, um, brand partnerships, and, and so forth. But a lot of us are just like, well, how do you do that exactly? <laughs> like, like, yeah. And I have met young designers that have come up to me at High Point Market and Las Vegas Market and said, I want to be the next and then they say whoever their design idol is. And what I know is, because I've had good, long, heart-to-heart -heart talks with a lot of these iconic designers, is that it's not the moment that you see them splash in our consciousness. It's the five or 10 years prior to that, that we never heard of them, that a lot of the work was going on. And what I understood when I read about you and your company was that that's exactly what you help people do. You help people to do that road mapping and that crafting from the, the idea of who I want my, my business and my brand to be and help them get there. Am I on the right track? Yeah, you're absolutely are on the right track. Okay. Okay. So what do we have to think about if was, and I don't necessarily mean like, I, like I was 53 when I started this podcast and I like, you know, I'm creating an empire, gosh darn it. So I don't care what age we are, but what are the things that we want to think about if this is our goal in the future? Yeah. So there's several DNA, what I call the DNA that makes up a brand. And if you look at any successful brand like Apple, if you look at, you know, Tesla, there's actually a reason why it had become so powerful and it's by design. Most people, whether they're individual entrepreneurs or small businesses that want to become bigger businesses, generally speaking, they're doing it from the hip. When you right. do it from the hip, you're gonna, your burn rate, unfortunately, be so high, it's going to be difficult to actually stay afloat, be sustainable, but it makes it very challenging at the same time to actually scale and grow your company. So when you do it from design, there's actually certain core principles, regardless of what industry, regardless of what category you're attempting to dominate, there's core principles, which I call the DNA to the brand. And some of these DNA pieces, code that makes up your brand, I should say, is going to be, for example, your vision, okay, would be one of them, your philosophy, your brand promise, your core message the brand personality, okay? These are just some of the attributes that build a brand very quickly if they're done right in the right sequence. And in addition to this is to understand that branding is a very broad topic. And there's three major points to branding. There's three major, you could say, pillars to branding. Strategy, there's a brand implementer, and then there's brand management. And those three need to work together. Generally speaking, uh, someone that specializes in branding only masters one of those domains or we could call pillars, okay? But okay. when you look at how they all work together, that's when you really become unstoppable. Okay, so a couple things I want to break out in there. So first of all, just to talk about those three pillars. And what you're talking about is if – when you say whether we're individually the master of our own brand or we're working with maybe a publicist or something like that, often what you find is that one pillar is concentrated on and the other pillars aren't as strong. And that's what, what, that's what the breakdown is in the difference be between coming that, becoming that iconic brand and just kind of doing it over again the same day and expecting different results. Exactly. It's kind of like, you know, you enter into uh, Daytona 500 race and then you only lap 100 laps. <laughs> you forget about the 400. <laughs> You're not thinking of the end game. <laughs> So you never managed to the finish line. I did the first line. hundred really good, right? I did the first hundred fast. I was the fastest one. <laughs> I like that analogy. I like that analogy because you could be the leader in the first hundred laps, but if you like just like trail off, like so what? What have you done for me lately, right? <laughs> exactly. 
Okay. Okay. So whether we're doing it ourselves or we're working with somebody, we're looking for the three key areas to be with a plan and, you know, with the thing. Now we're going to go back to building that plan and like building that strategy, right? So the strategy is the first one. And you're saying that it begins with establishing your vision, your brand promise, your core message, the personality of your brand. And so what would you say? So when you're working with a more established company, like you've worked with Disney and you've worked with like lots of these big companies, right? And so when you come in and you're working with an established company, and even if it might be an established design firm, maybe they're eight or 10 years in in business, they probably have an idea. If they listen to this show, they know what their vision and their mission is because I like bang it into their heads a hundred times a month. However, (laughs) um, they probably have a concept, but a newer professional, somebody who is at the beginning of their career and does have the vision, I want to be a Corey Damon Jenkins someday. Do you find that they sometimes don't really, they just know they want to rule the world, but they don't necessarily know what this brand promise and this vision is, or is that what you run into and you find? I run into it all the time, even with well seasoned companies that are already bringing in a billion dollars. You'd be surprised, oh. yeah, literally surprised at that. <laughs> yeah, they I don't have a philosophy. <laughs> yeah, they don't have a philosophy. <laughs> but here's what happens: they run out of steam and they reach a lid, and they can't bust that mm-hmm. lid, and they can't figure out why they can't remove that lid and go more global. Okay, so it happens on all sides. Companies, not even just individuals, solopreneurs or serialpreneurs, it happens to all size businesses uh, where if you don't have these, if you don't have these pillars in place, it's DNA in place, you will reach a lid and you won't reach your full potential. That's the bottom line. And do I hear the reason why we hit the lid? And is the reason why, for instance, if I'm a billion dollar company, and I have not taken the time to um, really think out my vision and my core values and my brand promise. Am I hitting the lid, Howard, because what happens is it builds me to a certain point, but it doesn't transcend. And like Apple isn't just known by people who are computer geeks, right? right. All of us, you know, like the, every, you, you can't, you can't, you know, find three people in a room and at least one or two of them is like an Apple loyal brand. Like, oh my God, how could you have a phone and other than an iPhone, right? So is that because having that vision and that core values and that brand promise transcends the actual product that you're delivering? Is, am, I, am I on the right track? No, you're absolutely correct. So the vision, the way I define a vision is what legacy you're leaving behind, Mm. for example. So vision for me is not about how much money you're going to make. It's what difference you're going to make. Okay. And then when you start to see how this has a ripple effect, like let's say someone uses a product, right? Let's say just take an iPhone, for example. Someone uses the iPhone and then they're able to actually have dialogues with their coworkers or, you know, people in their family or whatever it may be that they realize that this powerful tool and also called apps and chats and messages allows them to have communication that they didn't have before. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well then that family starts to impact the community with that iPhone. And then that community starts to impact societies. Look at countries now are impacted by the phone, right? right? It's not even a phone. It's a platform. Right. Nevertheless, it's really about what legacy you're going to leave behind based on a vision that that makes a big difference for how your product is going to be thought of and looked at. It's going to be transcending exactly what you say. It's going to be transcending its limitations and it's going to get into the more of the emotions. Okay. And the behaviors of why someone would want to have your product or service or information. Okay, so that's okay. that's that's vision, and then the philosophy is more about why you exist. What is your quote unquote um, story? What is your quote? Um, you can look at it from the standpoint. What is your story? What do you stand for, and why? Okay. So the philosophy is why do you exist, and it has to be more than about making a product. It has to look at from the standpoint. How are, how can the people align to who I am 
for based on what I stand for and what's actually going to have those people align and share the message about what I stand for that resonates with them that they're actually going to tell their friends. So it starts right. to catch fire, right? Okay. Right, right. So from from the perspective of an interior designer, it's really having a very, you know, it's taking the time to really think about why am I doing this, right? What is the reason? What is my story? Why does it connect? And the thing, Howard, is is that we have had lots of conversations on the podcast with designers who it almost feels like, you know, aren't you lucky? Because, you know, maybe you come from, I remember way back in the very beginning of the podcast, I think it was like in the first 15 episodes, Cheryl Jenis was on the show. And seven years ago, wellness and design weren't really often talked about in the same sentence. Um, right. it, it really just wasn't, at, I'm, I'm, there's always the, you know, early adopters, but it wasn't mainstream. And Cheryl Janice had a particular personal history of multiple times being in accidents and you know, different things happening to her, which caused her to be multiple times in chiropractic offices and, and, and rehab offices and all of the things. And she said that, you know, these would go on for weeks and months at a time. And it was, she said at one point, here she is maybe turning a quarter, a corner and starting to actually finally feel the effects and feeling better, but going to these dingy, gross places was also working on her negatively. And so she took the plunge and she talked about how hard it was here. She was an interior designer that does residences and does all the things. And she just kept saying that she felt called to do boutique healthcare design you know, hospitality, you know, and so that's great when the story is like, yay, I've got a really (laughs) solid story. But what if your solid story, like others are just like, I just, I'm driven and I, you know, I have talent and I can run a business and I just want to be the next X, Y, Z. Like, have, do you have ideas on how people can have that conversation with themselves to tap in? Yeah, absolutely. So it's looking through your lens, like meaning the individual. Okay. So as an interior designer, you're basically sharing your world with others. You need to write down like, what is it that you like or dislike and exactly what you're saying, how that impacts environment can actually impact someone's feeling and behaviors and emotions. <laughs> right. Right, so then it's, right. it's, so then what I always suggest is write down all the things that you would change about like even how we actually, you know, when it coming into a space, what would be the customer's journey in that space? What would we want to change? What would we want to change about perhaps how the interior design reflects the architecture? Okay. It's kind of like I had a client um, where we actually looked at how she was doing things differently. And we, we focused on was her process. Okay the process of how she did her interior design, which was very fascinating. She had this all stuffed away, but she never was able to express it because she didn't have know the right questions to be asked to get quality answers. So the point being is this, what we found out with her as an interior designer is that her interior designer shapes the architects. It's reversed. Okay. Okay. Why? Because we found that people spend most of the time not being and observing the building, but being inside the space. 99% of the time, they're inside the space right on the outside. They're coming in through the gateway, right? Mm -hmm. Through the front door or whatever it may be, right? But really, the entrance, really where they're spending their time is the environment within. So we had it reversed Mm -hmm. where she actually had an architect... um, in-house by the way but she never was utilizing it to tell in her story why she sees things differently in her lens well anyways a long story short is that we showed that her process became more effective in a sense of creating a, such an environment for people to live in whether it's a family or loved ones or as individual where that environment they felt good they felt something special about it 
outside of the the other traditional ways of doing it, where you start with the outside architecture plan and then you work on the inside. It completely right. changed how people felt within their environment. Okay, so that's what I mean I by see. looking at what you don't like and what you like and creating a story. Yes, and what I love about that is is that it's not this crazy niche answer like wellness design or sustainable design. It literally is something personal to her that she approaches her process from the standpoint of architecture and just her process itself is something to be spoken and celebrated and, and brought out. So, and that's, that's what I love. That's a relatable example because it helps us realize we're not looking for the only thing. We're looking for the thing only about us, right? Like, you know, for all my longtime listeners, they know it's our Fred Burns only. So, you know, um, anyway, okay. So now, so here's the thing. We have to start, we do the inner work, it sounds like. We have to figure out who we are. Basically, what I'm hearing is, who are you? What do you stand for? Why should I care? And how are you going to execute on it? Like, that's what I'm hearing in your DNA. It's like, just get clear, lady or guy, on what you want. Because if you're just the next garden variety interior designer, then there's nothing to differentiate. You know, like I always say, Howard, to all the designers on the show, I expect you to do pretty. Like the fact that your portfolio is amazing, so that's not your differentiator. Right. I know that each of these interior designers look at all of their uh, co- colleagues' portfolios and see the differences from theirs to them. I don't see anything different. I see pretty in all of them. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? And so the point is the differentiator is inside. And then it says that when you, I was reading your information, it says, to identify and profile your customer aspirations. So now are we turning it outward? Like how, are, how, what does this mean? Yeah. So when it comes to building a brand, people get confused and they think, oh, it's the logo, it's a product, it's a service, it's a business. It's those things contribute in a mind of consumer, but ultimately it's what they are saying, not what you are saying. A brand is what others are saying, not what you are saying. The question becomes, how do you influence them to say what you want them to say about you? That's where you have to create an alignment between how you're positioning yourself and understanding your target market, what would be their aspirations? Not just problem solving, but what is the ask? Go beyond that. Don't go beyond solving a problem, becoming a solution. But what is it something that you could bring to another level that they had not thought of to create such a fantastic space that they're just in awe every time they step in that space? Okay. Okay. So, so use an example for me. So, for example. Sure. I read about you that you took what which sounded like, you know, a flailing Los Angeles marathon and completely reinvigorated it and brought it, you know, back to life and got 23,000 people to show up and, and run the race. So is there an analogy or an example that you can use in there? Like, was there in their original messaging where they weren't attracting runners? Was it because they weren't identifying with you know, you said, yes, you got to solve your customer's problem, but maybe they weren't identifying with this next level, this aspirational level of the customer. Is there an example in there? Yeah, absolutely. What was lacking was communication. In this case, visual communication. (laughs) Okay. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So, so everything is about communication and there's different bodies of language in communication, whether it's verbal communication, audio, audio communication, or visual communication. What they did did not take in consideration for the last 15 years at the time was how we actually, the principles behind colors to begin with. So they designed these bus wraps that would be the number one way of how they would actually attract people to want to run a marathon by having these billboards be 24-7, right, advertisement spaces. Mm -hmm. What was lacking or what was a miss-up was that the buses themselves were so complicated in their design and they blended in the background. They never actually popped from the background in the foreground. And what they also didn't take into consideration during 
March in LA, we usually have really sunny blue skies. So blue skies, contrasting colors, yellow. Yellow and blue made it where now it grabbed a lot of attention very quickly. Okay. Okay. So there's a unco- there's what's called neuroscience, right? It happens on a conscious level in an unconscious level. Why am I attracted to that? And that has to done. And that has to happens to be reason why we survive, right? For this many years as a human species, because we automatically have that built into our brain and we start utilizing that for our design, whether interior design or design itself. It's all about how you're communicating, how fast are you communicating? In this case, it was grabbing the people's attention. And then it was about creating the attention where it was legible to read, which all their vehicle wraps and everything on billboard were illegible because they're trying to put too much copy. Okay. The best designs is where you have it where it's dominant, subdominant, subordinate. So you could read things in chunks and that's how we assimilate in our mind. Okay. So those are just a few things of what we did to change and use the principles behind strong design to communicate to the runners why they should run the LA marathon. And of course okay. it was a lot of other pieces to this, but that was overall the reason right, right. why so, we actually had a blowout. Okay. So that li- literally communication. So it wasn't so much that they had their messaging off or different things. They were just delivering the message, you know, in a way that didn't stand out from all of the other tr- street traffic and scenes in the middle of, you know, busy Los Angeles traffic. Right. Okay. So I, I, and I love that because, you know, that's also, you know, there's a lot of people probably involved in running the Los Angeles marathon and it got by all of them, (laughs) like, you know, Right. (laughs) so that's what you need an expert for. Okay. So, so when you think about somebody who's on this journey, whether they're 10 years in business, 20 years in business or five, and they want to aspire, they do aspire to standing out nationally, internationally as a brand. So it's the internal work, vision, mission, values, core, brand promise, get clear on that. Then it comes with understanding your your potential client. Is is that sort of what those, like, understanding their problems and their aspirations? Exactly. Right? You understand exactly what you do, what you want to look at is what is it that you have to offer and offering to whom? What problems are you going to solve? And what will be the aspirations? What can you do that actually becomes more powerful than the next person as far as your solution? And quite honestly, a lot of times it's looking at what is your process? See, when it comes to services, a lot of times because I work with a lot of B2B companies as well as B2C, right? Everybody has a process. They don't even realize they could capitalize on a process to make them unique and distinct to have a better deliverable, <laughs> to end right. up with a better mm-hmm. result. And it could be mm-hmm. like even like how they start even the dialogue with, the, with their, their actual customer or the prospect. Mm-hmm. What is the actual process that you're going to take them through, which I call the customer journey, that they have an experience going, oh, my God, no one's ever asked that question. No one ever thought of that. And so what happens is that you're actually creating a, a brand experience to that prospect or let's say to the customer in a way that you're going to deliver on a brand promise met, and you're going to match and go beyond their expectation. So there's two parts to this. There's the expectation of the consumer, and then there's the actual experience. What needs to be clear is what you're going to promise that customer and deliver on that promise as an aspiration that delivers beyond their expectation. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, <laughs> it does. It does. It does. So what I'm hearing is that we have to, if we truly aspire to stand out nationally, internationally, we have to have our house in order. That's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing we have to have our house in order. We have to have our inner work done. We have to have our business inner work done, our process, our client journey, our client experience has to be clean and duplicatable and 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 at an elevated level. And then how, what is the deal in this, Howard? Is the deal in this that, you know, when you, we take it back down to a granular where, again, somebody like a Corey Damon Jenkins, you know, attracts Kravit, 
which is right. a national fabric company, right, right, in our industry, to them. And maybe then he attracts, um, you know, the next company. I'm trying to think of his different licensing deals. Sure. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and is it that, is it as simple as I'm, what I'm hearing as simple as do such a good job being so good at what you do on all aspects that it's like I always say on the show, be prepared to be lucky so that when you might be the one to reach out or you have the opportunity to meet that that brand that one looks that is going to think to look to collaborate with you. Is it the attraction of knowing that that ship is organized and run well, or am I just biased to wanting businesses to be run well? Like how, like now we, like what I'm saying is once we've done our work, now how do we, what, what happens when we want to attract and work with the, the brands that are going to be those future partners and collaborators that cr- create that global stage for us? Sure. So if you're clear of your brand and what will make it a world-class brand is when you're clear of its DNA, the inner workings of the vision, the philosophy, the brand personality, the brand promise, the core messaging, and then it's actually building the right identity around that to reflect who you are. So that could be Mm. your website, your business card, that could be your presentations. So now there's an actual direct reflection of really your highest potential of who you are, okay? When you start then to broadcast that through the channels, distribution channels, meaning marketing, PR, sales, getting, you know, quote-unquote reps to represent you, or let's say say through media lines and media channels themselves, they all need to be consistent telling the same story. They all need to be consistent to say the same thing. So therefore, all that energy that's going out is highly identifiable. And that's where you get stickiness when people go, oh, I know what they stand for. I know I know her, her style or his style. It's consistent of how you're actually saying it as a core message throughout all your different channels, whether if it's visual, auditorial, okay, or the written word. Yeah. It's all being connected, okay? Yeah. So that's how yeah. you move things very quickly is when you do have, you're right, you do have a strategy and a structure in place. By the way, when companies want to do license degree with, with you, you better have a structure in place because you got to duplicate <laughs> yes. that same sensation for them. So it's like, think of it like a franchise. It's a having a recipe that's duplicatable. Okay. Right. But you have to first yeah. master that recipe and by the way, a lot of times with a lot of clients, depending on the, on the industry, we actually come up with a trademark name for that process. Mm. And we actually register it with mm. the government saying, this is our process. This is what's making us unique from everybody else. And then you start broadcasting whatever that word may be or that statement may be through your channels, through PR and marketing and sales and so forth and so forth. Therefore, people will want to call it and go, okay, I want to have that Intel, whatever, the brand within the brand, right? They, they want that mm-hmm. special formula, right? But yeah, that special right. formula is basically your signature style of how you do things differently than everybody else that rises above all the stuff that's out there because now you branded it in a way that sticks in the mind of the consumer, Ultimately, what it is, is to be a big enough brand that you're actually occupying space in a heart and a mind of the consumer that when they think and see anything that triggers a thought, like your like you know, the logo, the name, it automatically triggers in their back of their mind going, I know what they stand for. I know why I should buy them. I know why I should purchase them. That's what happens with licensed agreements. They, the licensing companies understand what they stand for because it's instant recall. There's, right. This is, goes into the neural science of things. I love it. I love it. It makes so much sense. So I'm, you know, what I, ex, what I said needs to be in place, but I missed the actual way that you connect to the brand. And that was what my heart, my core question was, right? So you have to have all of that work done, the who you are, what you stand for, your brand promise, what you believe in, have your business on lockdown, running all the systems, and then the connection to attracting the collaborations is 
all of the, your marketing, every time you're in public, whether it's a speaking engagement, it's a panel discussion, it's your social media, you're now basically teaching the world what to think about you. And it matches what you've decided you think about yourself, right? Um, exactly. But when, right? And when you teach the world what to think about you, then the big brand out there that's saying, we want this thought you know, to be aligned with our brand. Oh, that's the message that Corey Damon has. Oh, that's the message that Stacey Garcia has. That's the message that so-and-so has. And then they reach out for a brand with them. A exactly. Exactly. It's kind of like Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola since the seventies, they've done it brilliantly. And this is called brand attributes. All the focus of the message is only one thing. Open happiness. <laughs> all their advertising, all their marketing is all focused on happiness. I mean, how simple yeah. is that, right? And the great thing is Back that they have the 60s, it. <laughs> teach the world to sing, right? Exactly, like 70s, exactly, exactly, sing, right? exactly. <laughs> Probably the best, com- one of the best commercials ever, right? right. It was all Just about yeah, it, community. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was fun to watch, right? It was like a magnificent. It was, it was brilliant, <laughs> and it was like one world. It was open happiness. We were here together, <laughs> and the point being is this: is that now there's all these triggers which are called touch points. So you have, you know, Diet Coke, you got Coke Zero, so forth and so on. You got all the Coke identity family that's all similar, but yet different. But nevertheless, these are all cues of open happiness, why you need to have a Coke. You know, when if you go into a foreign country, let's say you've never been there before and you're on a grocery store, see on the grocery shelf, all these other drinks that are out there and you see a Coke bottle and the shape itself, by the way, is unique. Yeah. Yeah. The likelihood you're going to pick that up because it's built in trust. Yes. Yes. You know what it's going to taste like. You believe in it. You rely on it. And, you know, you're going to start singing. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're going to start singing. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. So, that, that, those are, so that's the reason why you're exactly right. You got to understand the meaning behind your brand, what it stands for, because all your messaging are, should be designed to trigger those thoughts in the mind of the consumer on a subconscious level. Therefore, you stand out against all the clutter that's out there. Okay. And then when we achieve these goals, right, mm-hmm. we've, we, we achieve this and we're finally at the point where we're creating brand collaborations and we are known for what we have decided we believe in ourselves to be, then this circles back and starts to strengthen and enhance all the revenue streams that we have, right? Like our initial interior design firm does better. The licensing all does better because we're just consistently showing up in the same way with a purpose. That's the other thing. It's like we've, we, in our creating our vision and our core values and our brand uh, promise, we're, we're, we're staking a point of view. We're not saying, well, I could like white decorating or I could like gray decorating. It's like, we're saying a point of view, right? Exactly. Exactly. You're right. It, it, the philosophy is what I equate to the purpose of the brand. And that mm-hmm. is, again, where it's driven through what I call the ideology of the brand, the ideology okay. of the brand, right? So it's like, what is the beliefs? And then what beliefs do you have in that brand that's had an actually influenced behavior? <laughs> right? Okay. okay. Right. Right. Okay. And then ultimately, we have, we should be so lucky, if we're lucky, to have this problem where we get to a point where we are attracting multiple collaborations and multiple ways that we're showing up. And we don't want to dilute things then. So what's the message and what's the lesson in that area, Howard? Okay, so there's, there, this gets a little bit more complex, but I, I think it's definitely appropriate to talk about. There's two ways to build a brand, a house of brand or a branded house. Okay. So you got Say like, it again, like, a house, a house of brand or a branded house. And it's okay. best to figure this out earlier than later, <laughs> because I'll talk about okay. what's called brand equity and what's brand value. Okay. So a house of brands is where you got like general motors and the general motors as a sub brand has GM, those has Chrysler, it has Pontiac, it has, you know, Saturn, the list goes on, right? 
because they went through mm-hmm. acquisitions and each of those different sub brands is geared towards a different profile of that persona of that individual shopper, that consumer, right? Mm-hmm. So that gets very expensive. At the same time, it gets kind of cluttered in a sense, what does GM actually stand for? Okay. Now there's points where it's actually necessary and needed, like where you have the shining water and Coca-Cola and you want to separate the two because Coca-Cola is known for, you know, the syrup taste where water, it wouldn't really work because now you actually have to change the whole belief system, what Coke stands for. So it makes sense then, right? When it comes to a branded house, a branded house, it's where you're actually working with off one brand which is usually the parent brand. And then you have the sub brands, but they're all associated and tied into that parent brand. So for example, like BMW, you got the 100 to 200 series or 300 series. That's aspirational branding, by the way. So the idea is that you're in high school, you get the 100 car. And then when you're in college, you might get the 200 or 300. And then when you become a, you know, in a professional world, you're inspired, you love the German engineering, the feel of the car, and you move to the 700, 800 model, right? So that's right. aspirational, but that's called a branded house. So when it comes to interior designers, they need to think about it in that way, but it might be what's called line extensions. Here you have, quote unquote, someone's name that they want to brand, which is another subject itself. Should you have your own name or should you actually have an entity with its own brand name? But that's another mm. story. That is the point a being question. is that <laughs> yeah, that's a big topic. <laughs> but you could have like exactly what you're saying. You could have private labeling. You could have its white labeling, licenses agreements. And so you're looking at all the what I call the platform to your revenue model is what are the all the opportunities you could actually create money, but you have to master one of those spaces first to move into the other spaces. For example, like if you, let's say, I'm just making this up, but you say your brand that's well known and it gets distributed in certain marketplace and you took all that energy and time to get that distribution channel in place. Like let's say it's 15 different, different distribution channels. Well, what's great about that is that when you come up with a second brand, let's say a knockoff brand, you're, you're one brand super high end, you knock yourself off because you know you're the, other people to knock you off. So you create a knockoff brand, right? Right. Now to make it easier for that knockoff brand to go through those so same channels that you work so hard on because you establish your network, you establish your platform. You see how that works? Okay. Companies run into big problems when they try to do too much and force too much. Their burn rate, they will exhaust and exhaust their capital really fast if they don't master space first and then have in mind already up front, which is called the architecture of their business and brand, and understand if they hit a certain number, let's say the first 100,000 and say the first million or whatever it may be, then it would be appropriate to start, quote unquote, working on that second brand to move through those distribution channels. That's the really smart way of doing it. So I'm going to use an example and you see if I'm understanding what you're talking about. So, for example, in the design industry, I'm thinking of um, Kristen Rivoli. Okay. She's a Boston area designer, high end, super luxury designer, super talented. I don't know if it's 20 years in the business or more, but established, seasoned designer, well-established name. Now, I'm not talking about national or international, but in her pond and in our industry, you know, she's, she does good work and she's known for it. What she did was she came up with a thing called Rooms by Rivoli. I think that's how she, she calls it. And she was on the podcast and we'll put the episode in the show notes for you guys. Um, but it was like, what she described was, I said to her, why did you do this? Why did you make another business within a business, Kristen? And she said, well, my, my company evolved. I got to the point where I'm doing full service luxury design for, you know, only full houses, say. I don't know if it's half, you know, if you want floors or full houses. But you get to the point where you're not coming out for the living room anymore, right? That's right. what happens, right? And so she said, but, you know, I did come up. The way we all come up, I didn't pop out of, you know, the design universe and start doing full houses and had relationships with you with the community and people that she had known through the years and felt like 
that brand had become so well established as a luxury full service. Like if you have to ask, it's probably you can't afford me type of a brand. Right. But wanted to have something for even the children of her clients or younger clients that are aspirational to work with her, but don't have the budget yet to do it. But in 10 years they would. And so she does this rooms by Rivoli where she does these designs and she puts it together and it doesn't matter. It's the knockoff brand for, for logic's sake. Right. See what you were saying is she didn't come out of the gate and go, I could either do your full service luxury whole house, or I could do this e-design board for you. Like that's a no, no, because that's confusing and the marketplace doesn't understand what you are. So you're saying, come out and do one, whatever it is, and then pull the other, you know, entity along with it. Once you're established. Did I read you right? Exactly. 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 Okay. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's really smart because you're actually right. It's about how many revenue streams can you build and having that figured out front, but also knowing what do you want to be known for, for first. Right. Okay. Like you got yes. Coke, Coke, first. Diet Coke didn't come out first. <laughs> right? right, it was Coke right. first and Diet Coke, and then Coke Zero. Then it gave alternatives and options. That the mainstay, of course, is a regular formula. Yes, yes, and so because that that is and can be the Achilles heel of a talented business person that's also a talented visionary. Right. They could be at the beginning of their career and be like, I got this idea and I got this idea and I got this idea and I have the skill set and the talent to make them all work. But from a branding perspective, it's somewhat suicidal because you're coming out of the gate and people don't know where to place you. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And not only that, you didn't establish enough brand awareness to have a foothold foothold for those other quote unquote sub brands to push through easier. Right, 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 and right, right. Much right. easier, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of like not having a niche at all, it, and it, and you're all—it's all in design. But really, it's like I don't know what you are. Well, wait, you know, oh my God, we just went back to the very first thing you said: is right. who are you and what do you do? Right? Like, are you a luxury brand or are you an a brand that is? And by the way, there's nothing wrong with either. Your goal might to be come out at that mid level and be the designer for you know the everyday garden variety variety of humans like us that are not multi-billionaires, right? Um, so it doesn't matter what it is, but it does go back to what you said in the very beginning. Know for you what it is, right? right? No, exactly. And the other thing too, quality always pays off. So when you're mm-hmm. thinking about your brand at the very beginning, here, so here's in a big picture of things, there's only two ways you brand, but I said from the hip or by design. The other way, and when you take that formula, as well, there's only one category you could occupy either by va- um, price driven or quality value driven. In the real world, there's only one that could also only be price driven because now you're talking about sheer volume, like Walmart. Mm. All others must show that you're quality value driven. Otherwise, you're going to get beaten up in the price and beaten out of the market and actually dissolve as a company. That's why you have to have a brand that actually then, quote unquote, tells the story why you're value driven and what problems you solve around that space. But better yet, again, aspirational, go beyond what the customer wants. Right. Right. I love it. I love it. It's so good. I mean, (laughs) he gave us so much to think about, Howard, really. Um, I feel like this is the type of show that listening to it a second or a third time, I would hear different things, right? You know, almost like, oh, he actually said in there that, you know? Um, So I appreciate that kind of show, that kind of conversation, because it gets me thinking. And what I love about it, too, is, uh, you know, I can't not give a shout out to Nicole Heimer, who is the CEO and the founder of Glory and Brand. And Nicole is a, is a good friend of mine. She's my creative director, Howard. Um, she has been a co-author in um, my, one of my Power Talk Friday experts books. And her domain is she creates websites, but she creates them from the brand first. 
She's not the kind of person like, oh, you want a flower there? You want it blue? You want it this? Like she has this whole discovery process. You can't just have a website. Like I have to do a deep dive on your psyche and what you want and who you want to want what you want and all the things. And so the point is, Many of the things that you said today literally line up with the things that she has told us on the show and that she's also taught me, you know, in the background here. Um, And what I'm also observing is using different words. And I like that. I like when I hear, oh, that means the same thing as this, because one way when you hear it, I'm kind of clicks something and maybe you get a different learning lesson or a deeper learning lesson out of it, you know? Right, right, exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. By the way, what you're bringing up too, which is super critical when a designer, interior designer is building their brand, is a brand manual, not a style yeah. guide. So style guides are great, but those only tell you the do's and don'ts about the font and colors to use, right? Mm-hmm. And how to place the logo. A brand manual is where you get everyone to adapt to your thinking of your brand. Like, what goes in a brand manual is your philosophy, your vision, you know, what actually even all the way down to what words should be spoken and what words should not be spoken to represent your brand. So when you hand over to PR marketing and social media, there's consistency. Oh, I love you that. You see that? So it's so I it's love that. It's keeping control of your brand, literally. It's keeping yes. control of your brand, just like you do with interiors of companies where you have procedures and policies to keep yeah. control of your culture. Is exactly the same thing, but it's going to be a much broader because we're talking about all the stakeholders. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But you're right. I mean, there are certain things like, you know, expensive versus investment range. Like there's ways that as the CEO of your company, you have certain things that you like, I'm like, I'm the same way. I don't do my own emails, right? I don't read them and I don't do them. Like I eventually, you know, but it's a lot for me. It's um, verbal communication with my assistant and there'll be times when I'm like, and she's so good. She, she gets me. And so I'll, you know, the email, she'll put the email on my Monday board and then I boxer her. Okay. This is what, and there's times when I'm like, this is my intent. This is how I want to convey it. This is my feeling and my end game. And so those are the things I tell her, right? Because it could be somebody's pushing me around, not not making an appointment, but sometimes I care and sometimes I don't, right? right. So sometimes I'm like, look, this is their last chance and I don't right. care if they make another one. We're still nice. We talk nice out loud, but yeah. I don't really care. And other right. times I'm like, and I really want to meet with this person. So let's <laughs> rope them down, but do it this way, right? right? But I don't give her all the words. But right. every once in a while, I'll be like, here is the verbatim thing I want you to say, right? right. Because it is, it, there's words matter. And so to have a brand manual all the way down to the words that you use, I think makes 100% sense. I like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, this is how good. this is really how good. people are going to be able to control. Quite honestly, their publicists, everything yeah. that has to do with how they want to be seen and heard, literally. Yes, 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 yes. Love it. I love it. So I have one little question, which might not be little, but let me ask it before you go. Um, naming your business, your interior design firm, Sally Smith Interiors versus Dunes and Beaches Interiors. <laughs> okay. My listeners are all like, oh my God, you're driving me crazy, Land. Okay. <laughs> so the thing is that I feel like when I started seven years ago, I noticed way more firms with a, ge- not, not generic, but a name that's not their own name. And right. now I feel like everybody's firm is named their name. And I noticed many have gone from a quote unquote generic name to switching it to naming themselves. But what's so funny is I feel like even in the last three months, people are chattering about going back to not having the name as the name of the principal. So it's like almost like tiny little whispers, but what's your, what's your take on that, Howard? Well, I, it's funny that you ask that because right now with interior design and architect, we're changing the company name because it is our personal name. But we found out what why this is an issue is because as I hire more people, even the employees feel like they're not being, quote unquote, um, adding value to the company's brand because the company's brand's name is the individual, the CEO, and the founder. 
So that's mm-hmm. a, so they don't feel like they actually have like a say. They don't feel like they belong. They don't feel like there's a bigger picture than just boosting the ego of the actual founder. Oh, okay. Whoa. Yeah. So the philosophy, back to the philosophy and vision, looking at the vision and the philosophy, f- what legacy you leave, leave behind from the vision, and then why do you exist as a philosophy, a lot of times starts to determine are should you be using your own real name or should you be using a name for others to play with so others can be included you see that that's so smart so i see that because the way that that individual ceo functions and the upper management team functions is the same they're still inclusive it's a team environment all the things but the way the effect emotionally is on the greater team is that it's all about this person and not all about all of us creating something oh how that's very subtle that's interesting and it makes me think of shay mcgee let's think about this guys it's not shay mcgee interiors it's studio mcgee and that still has her name in it, but it still is like the studio is all of us. It's right. whoever answers the phone and whoever I send out on your project, even if it's not me. It's Studio McGee. So even that tiny nuance, I feel it in my gut. I feel that difference in my gut as opposed to Shea McGee Interiors. Yeah, we did this for another, another in another industry. A speaker was Ray Higdon, and we changed the Higdon group. Yes, yes. Because now there's more people that can participate on the stage, by the way. And then not only that, then a lot of times people are looking for that individual, whether it's interior designer or artist, such as like Tony Robbins. He's screwed. (laughs) Only he could call me. I could probably call him. You know, but I'm just saying. (laughs) So so a lot of people are, yeah, but when people call up, they go, I want Tony live. Why is this other speaker doing it in his place? So it causes yes. a, it causes a lot of quote unquote false expectations, false mm. expectations, and it yes. all impacts yes. the brand. By the way, and so we're going to end it right where we started. It's literally think about when you start where you want to be when it's done. Your, your legacy. What do you want to? And if if you because you know. Howard, we have many, I mean, I would venture to say thousands of designers listening that their goal is to have a firm, maybe one to two employees at max, make a great living, make clients happy, change their lives with beautiful spaces. And that's that. We might have 10% of the audience that is like, I'm going to be the next. But if you're thinking you're going to be the next, that's that's a great way because I can see that if you've got 20, 30 people working for you, it's it's a different who is the company we're working for. It's all of us or is it just you, even right. though you might be running it the same way. There's that intangible feeling. So good. I'm so glad I asked you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. All right. So now. um We'll put details in the show notes, that, um, but people can work with you directly. And is there some particular um, place that you would like us to direct them or something that you want to say about anybody who listened to you today, Howard, and thinks, I wouldn't mind taking the next step, and what is that next step? Yeah, so there's a couple of next steps. One on my website at howcreative.com, H-O-W creative.com. There's a free consultation. It's free. Above the menu bar, it's actually in the menu bar. It's hard. It's not. Dif- it's not difficult to miss. It's in red, and so that's the call to action. The second thing is then that will give you like a twenty minute conversation with me. If you want a full assessment, like your website, your design, I come from a design. Ba- I'm a designer, as you probably guess as well. Oh. I come from a design background. You know, I studied. Art Center School of Pasadena, Art Center School of Design, which is a top notch, and then Cal Poly, and then work my way up from designer, art director, creative director to brand director, right? But I still do a lot of designing. Wow. Okay. Wow. So, um, and I've helped out a lot of people in all kinds of spaces, specifically in the creative space. Um, so, nice. the free consultation will get you a 20 minute call just to get an idea of who you are, what you're doing, and what you, where do you want to go, and how you want to fill that gap. And then uh, online brand assessment, what I'm offering on a show, it's a special code. 
if you go to howcreative.com forward slash online dash brand dash assessment, that will take you to a form to fill out and that will get you a full hour with me to evaluate mm-hmm. anything that you're using to express your brand, your logo, the name, the website, um, anything, storefront, signage. I've, I, 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 we do this all, by the way. I, we do everything from advertising, commercials, everything. So I'm able to look at it and look and give you solid feedback to go from good to great, to figure out what's missing, wow. your value proposition. So if you fill out the form, it's a credit card form. It's usually $2,500 for this. But there's a place that says apply coupon. And if you put H-O-W, how, and hit apply, it will only be $500. Okay. Oh, Wow. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and you'll get a full hour you'll get a full hour with me uh of 35 years of experience of building you know multi-million and seven separate billion dollar brands so i'd be able to help you out <laughs> awesome i love it i love it howard thank you so much i appreciate you're giving us the code too so that's fun all right. Well, I, I just, I'm just so impressed and just so grateful for your expertise today and um, for your time today on the podcast, Howard. Thank you. You're welcome. It's been my pleasure. You know, it's absolutely my pleasure. I always think of, you know, in our space, in the creative space, is that we create all the rea- reality around us. So why not think big? <laughs> <laughs> like literally everything. It. Everything around us is created, right, from nothing. Yes, yes. <laughs> You're so right. You're right. Literally everything. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, thanks so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. All right. I mean, I love this conversation with Howard. And as I said during the show, Nicole Heimer of Glory and Brand, she talks about many of these same things. And she has been educating us throughout the seven years of this podcast with her participation in my book, The Power Talk Friday Experts, Volume One. But hearing, you know, same message ideas from a different voice sometimes helps, right? So let's recap what Howard says that we should be thinking about establishing a brand. First, he advises that we create a business. When we create it, it should be by design. Well, there's an idea for (laughs) you, right? I mean, he said this is what all the big guys like Apple and Coca-Cola do. And what does that mean exactly? Well, he explained that there are core principles that he refers to as the DNA of our business. He says this is your vision for your business, your philosophy, your brand promise, and your brand personality. These are attributes that will quickly build your brand when done in the right sequence. And he says if you don't have them in place, he says likely you may not reach your full potential. He runs into it all the time. So if you are a newer professional and you have a vision that you want to be the next Justina Blakeney or Nate Berkus, but you you have no idea what your brand promise is or your mission is, well, you've got some homework to do, right? He said that even companies who bring in millions that don't have a philosophy in space in place, it actually has prevented them from growing to the billions and going global. And often they have no idea why. All right. It kind of blows my mind that companies that bring in millions don't have all of this in place because it's just like I've talked a lot about in other episodes. Before succeeding in anything in your business, you need to establish your mission, your vision, and your values, right? As a designer, you need to ask yourself, why am I even doing this? Why does it matter to me? And why should it matter to others? Okay. The same goes for when you're formulating your brand. If you are one of those designers that we talked about, you want to be the next Joanna Gaines or Corey Damon Jenkins or Brigham Jane, you need to ask yourself these questions and do this inner work. However, you may even simply and honestly prefer to design a business that is profitable and gives you a comfortable lifestyle. You know that designing is your superpower and you know how to do the pretty and you just want to do it. So how do you tap into your brand philosophy if you don't have a big, huge story? Well, Howard says to look through your individual lens. As a designer, you're sharing your world with others. Write down your likes, your dislikes, and how they can impact someone's behaviors, feelings, and emotions. Write down everything you would change in a space. What would the customer journey be? Okay. Focus on your process. 
how often we do do we talk about this? I mean, like every show, right? <laughs> <laughs> Howard says it's not complicated. Okay, I might push him back a little on that. But it is what I think what he's saying is it's not complicated to understand that this is the core critical work to be done. Okay, that's not complicated. Doing it might be a different story. But if you're serious about being in business, it's a non negotiable, right? So when you do focus on your process, and then you can express it as part of your brand, ultimately, it becomes what your clients are saying about you. And to get them to say what you want them to say about you comes from knowing what you are, how you do it, what you do it, who you do it for, and then speaking to their aspirations and going above and beyond. Why should people care about how you um, are and what you do and how you communicate your brand, right? You got to do the work right? Another attribute Howard talks about, as it may, and it makes sense, is being consistent and making sure you're telling the same story. So it becomes identifiable and it sticks. It becomes memorable, right? This is how we strengthen our relationships and enhance all the revenue streams we have because everything in your business will do better when you start sprinkling your brand and your established identity consistently through all the marketing channels and tell the same story with purpose and meaning. Okay. Once you have that brand manual, um, that we've talked about, you can control everything with your publicist, your marketing team, yourself, if you're the one that does it. But then this, the thing is the questions go away. You know who you are, what you re represent and who you serve. Comes down to doing the inner work, right? You have to get your own house in order first. So if you'd like to work with Howard, he was kind enough to offer a discount code for his online brand full assessment. Just go to howcreative.com dash online dash brand dash assessment and you can sign up for a full hour where Howard will evaluate anything you use to express your brand and take it from good to great. This is usually a $2,500 value, but where it says apply coupon, put how, H-O-W, and you will get it for $500. Or if you just like a 20 minute free consultation with Howard, go to howcreative.com and you will see the option in the menu bar. Of course, we're going to put all the links in the show notes as well. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for joining me today. I do appreciate it. I hope you are looking at the website for luannlive.com and thinking of joining us in Orlando. And until then, decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. Have an excellent day.